Amen. Well, take your Bible this morning and turn with me to the book of John in chapter number 19. John chapter number 19 and find verse number 28. And I want to preach this morning on uh, this subject, uh, the death of a Savior. The death of a Savior. I don't know about you, but I walked outside this morning and I smelt springtime in the air. And the first thing that came into my mind is this is the season where we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, it is heartbreaking not to be together, but I saw a post this week on Facebook to which I said, Amen. It said, the churches may be empty, but so is the tomb. And so we may not be together here, but that has not diminished the power of Christ one bit. He is still our Savior who was born of a virgin, lived a perfect, sinless life, uh, died on the cross for the sins of you and me, and he was resurrected three days later. He ascended into heaven at the right hand of God the Father, and he is waiting the day when he comes back to receive us all unto himself. And as I was thinking kind of about what to preach, I just thought to myself, you know, I, I want to really, I want us to still think about, because there's a, there's a danger that if we don't... Um, if we don't meet together, that we may really forget what all this is about, what this season is really about. And so the Lord really just impressed it on my heart to remind us in our preaching time of what this time of year really is all about, that we celebrate the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so this morning, I really want to look at a very familiar passage of Scripture with you, and I want to pull some thoughts out of it, and, uh, and I hope that it will help you to remember what it is that we celebrate here in this Easter season. The Bible tells us that after Jesus had been resurrected from the tomb, that he was walking down a road and he encountered two men, uh, and he told them uh, that uh, he was the one who they had been anticipating. They were very sad. They had said to this man who at, at the beginning they didn't know that it was Jesus, but they asked him, they said, Sir, have you not heard about all that has gone on in this city, that the one who we perceive to be the Savior has been crucified? They've killed him. Jesus, understanding that they did not even know who they were talking to, the Bible says begins at Moses and all the prophets in the Old Testament and walks them up to that present day and he tells them and explains to them how that it had always been predicted that he would die. It had always been prophesied that he would have to give his life, but that he would also rise again on the third day. But through that statement, Jesus made a, a real uh, clear declaration to them that all of Scripture points to a culminating event. In fact, I would say to you that all of history points to a culminating event. All of history before this event looks forward to it. And all of history after this event looks backward to it. The event that I'm talking about is the event that we call the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Truly, all of our hope is contained in one single solitary event that happened over 2,000 years ago, around 2,000 years ago, on a hill there on the outskirts of the city of Jerusalem. If Jesus did not die, then you and I, friend, have no hope in this world. And if Jesus did not die for our sins, if he died, but he died just as another common criminal, if he did not die as the Son of God, the perfect spotless Lamb of God, then you and I have no hope. But I would say to you this morning that Jesus declares to us from the cross three words that remind us that when Jesus died on the cross, he did not die like any other Roman criminal or any other Jewish criminal, but he died as one who was actually paying a debt not owed to Caesar, not owed to the Pharisees, not owed to the Sanhedrin, but actually it was a debt that was owed to God himself. And it was not owed by Jesus, but it was owed by you and me. And Jesus makes a declaration on the cross, and what he's saying when he says this is he's telling us, the world, and he's telling God the Father that the debt that was owed has now been paid. 
Notice what the Bible says in John chapter number 9. John chapter number 19, excuse me, and verse number 28. The Bible says, after this, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there and they filled a sponge with sour wine. They put it on hyssop and they put it to his mouth. And so when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said three words in English, one word in the Greek. It is finished to telestai. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. That is to say, Jesus, the Son of God, in human flesh, hanging on a cross, literally and physically died. Father, help us this morning to preach with Holy Spirit anointing. God, help us to do through this time what we cannot do in our own strength and our own power. But Lord, I pray that you, if you give me unction and anointing and you'd speak to me during this time, I know that I could say something that would prick the hearts of people to remind them about what this season is really all about. Not only that, Lord, but I believe that through this message, if the Holy Spirit would help as the seed is scattered, that somebody who's listening, their heart may be pricked, their soul may be convicted, and they may realize that they have never trusted in you as their Savior and as their Lord. And Father, I pray today, dear, this morning, during this preaching time, that you would do what you said you would do if I would be faithful to do my job. And so I pray, Lord, now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, by strength and my Redeemer. I ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody at home said with me, Amen. I want to talk to you this morning about that very passage of Scripture that I just read. And, and I want to speak on this subject, the death of a Savior. The death of a Savior. Each of the gospel stories tells us a different aspect of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, so to speak. John is often referred to by himself in the Gospel of John as that disciple whom Jesus loved. And so we now call him today the beloved disciple. John writes his Gospel last. He's the last one of the first four Gospel writers to pin his down. It happens sometimes after 70 AD. And John writes his Gospel long after the temple even has been destroyed. We talked about that last week. And he paints for us a picture of the importance of believing in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, Merrill Tinney, the great Bible scholar, said that the gospel of John is the gospel of belief. Belief or believe, pestuo in the Greek, is used more times in the gospel of John than at any other place in the New Testament. Clearly, John is painting for us a picture that we must believe in something. And John writes vivid details of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, not so that we would weep. See, John believes that at this point in time when he's writing his gospel, and certainly at this point in time in 2020, that the, gospel, that, that the, the story of the cross should not stir up in us grief, but it should stir up in us hope and praise and worship. In fact, I believe John would agree with the hymn that we've sang for many years. I will weep no more for the cross that he bore, but instead I will glory in the cross. See, when I see the cross, yes, I see a place of suffering, I see a place of torment, I see a place of execution, but I also see a place of redemption and forgiveness and love and grace and mercy that was extended to me from the God of this universe. And so John is calling us to believe not only in the reality of the cross, but he's also calling us to believe in the redemption of the cross. See, John is encouraging you that you must believe not just that Jesus died, but you must believe that Jesus actually died as the payment, the elimination of debt that was owed on your behalf. 
See, I believe many modern scholars that are secular believe that Jesus was a real man who lived and died. But believing that he died is not enough. Placing all of your hope and your faith and your trust in that death is what real Bible salvation is about. We believe that literally salvation comes from the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so John, in these very brief three verses, paints for us a picture of some things about this death of the Savior that we really don't find anywhere else. They're unique to his story. Number one, I want you to notice that at the beginning of verse number 28, John tells us that this death of our Savior, it was a prophetic death. It was a prophetic death. What do you mean by that? I mean that it had prophetic implications to it. John tells us in verse number 28, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, what things were accomplished? Well, I would say to you that every prophecy about the cross that had been given concerning the cross had at this point been fulfilled. And therefore, Jesus says through John that all things have now been accomplished. And only one thing remained, and that was that Jesus had to really die. Well, see, one of the amazing things about the story of the cross and one of the amazing things about the Word of God in the Bible is that many things that happened at the cross were predicted hundreds of years beforehand. Well, you say, now preacher, we know that Jesus knew the Old Testament. I mean, we know that Jesus knew the Old Testament backward and forward. I mean, preacher, He was the Word of God after all. So, preacher, don't you think it's possible that Jesus could have just fulfilled these prophecies himself because he knew that they needed to be fulfilled in order for people to believe his story? Okay, sure. So, uh, there was a prophecy in the Old Testament that Jesus, while he was on the cross, would have his legs broken. Anybody out there think that Jesus broke his own legs on the cross? Just raise your hand. I don't know about you, but I think that he may have needed a little help with that one, don't you? Uh, the Bible says that Jesus, uh, on the cross in the Old Testament, it was prophesied that he would ask for a drink. Well, preacher, anybody can ask for a drink. Yeah, but not anybody who's nailed to a cross can make somebody give them a drink. And it was prophesied that not only Jesus would ask for a drink, but they would give him a drink. And it was also prophesied exactly what they would give him to drink. It's prophesied that they, as he was hanging there on the cross, would divide up his garments. And they did exactly that. And it was prophesied that while Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross that they would take a spear and they would pierce the side of our Savior. And they did exactly that. See, with detailed accuracy, the Bible, hundreds of years beforehand, pinpointed the events of the cross before they ever actually took place. And now Jesus, knowing that all things have been completely and totally fulfilled, knowing that the only thing left for him to do is to physically die, now looks out at them and he says something a lot like what the Apostle Paul says. Jesus says, the time of my departure is at hand. And the Bible says that he, he, he speaks three words and he says, it is finished. He gives up the ghost. You say, preacher, why do you mention these Old Testament prophecies? Because I would say to you that all of Scripture is focused on one single event, and that is the event of the cross. And I would say that all of history should be focused on one single event, and that is the event of the cross. And I would say to you this morning that the cross proves to us one thing, that this book that we have is an infallible, inerrant, uncorruptible, perfect book that can be trusted for every single situation of life. These prophecies told of a coming Messiah that we all were waiting for. Not only was it a prophetic death, but I would say to you secondly that it was a, it was a painful death. It was a painful death. Verse 28 in the second part says, Jesus saying that the Scripture might be fulfilled, He said two words. He said, I 
thirst. And a vessel of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. <laughs> this is the fifth and the sixth sayings that we believe Jesus uttered while he was on the cross. He may have said more, but if he did, we, we don't have them recorded in Scripture. First, the fifth saying, Jesus says to the crowd that is standing nearby him as he is about to die, he looks at them and he says, I thirst. What a picture of our Savior. There's a song that was written by an old Southern Gospel singer that said, the same one who created the waters, who created the rivers, who created the seas, who created everything that we exist in in this world, that same God now looks around at Roman soldiers and he says to them, I thirst. The one who participated in the creation of the world, the one who was there when they said together, let there be light and there was light, the one who separated the day from the night, the one who upholds this world by the word of his power, according to Hebrews chapter 1. That same God looked around and humbly asked for a drink. His thirst gives us a great picture of the fact that Jesus Christ was, while being 100% God, at the same time 100% man. He was completely divine, yet He was also completely human. I believe Jesus got hungry. I believe Jesus got thirsty. I don't believe He just said it to fulfill a prophecy. I believe Jesus said, I thirst because He was thirsty. I believe Jesus experienced physical pain. I believe Jesus got weary. I believe Jesus experienced sadness. I believe there were times when he rejoiced. I believe there were times when he groaned. If you don't believe he ever got angry, just go read about the time that he went into the temple. And you'll find that Jesus Christ was filled with many of the same human emotions that we have today. See, Jesus Christ, when He came to this earth, did not lay aside His status as God. He did not lay aside His deity or His divinity. But when He came to this earth, He took upon Himself humanity, and He was such a real human that He actually needed a drink because His mouth was dry. God the Father does not thirst. As far as we know, angels don't get thirsty. But our Savior, Jesus Christ who had come in human form and hung on a cross, was thirsty. Philippians 2 says that Jesus humbled himself to the point of a man. He humbled himself so low that he realized that when he was coming to this earth, he knew he was coming for one reason, and that was to die. That's why he's compared to a lamb, to a sheep. Many animals that we have in our modern American society, they're born for one purpose, to be raised up, to be killed. And Jesus was that lamb who was led to the slaughter. He was sent to this earth for one purpose, to die for our sins. Yet at the same time that we see His humanity on full display we at the same time see His divinity. In all that He had suffered, in all the pain that He was feeling, He was still cognizant and understanding of the work that He had come to do. I really believe when I, believe, when I read the Gospels that if you and I had gone through what Jesus had gone through, we'd have already passed out a long, long time ago. But Jesus still knew that He had a work to do. He knew the Scriptures had predicted that he would thirst, and he verbalizes this humiliating physical pain. But yet Jesus never forgets why it is that he's come. And I would say to you this morning that the most painful part of his death is not that he was thirsty, 
It was not that his hands hurt where the nails had gone through. It was not that his feet hurt where the spikes had pierced. It was not that his head ached where the crowns had jabbed through the skin. But the most painful part was that in his humanity, the Bible says that Jesus Christ took on his back at the cross the sins of all those who would believe in him. And it caused separation between him and the one whom he loved, his Father in heaven. And that, more than anything, crushed his soul. Many people have said the, the whips and the nails and the crown, they crushed his body, but the separation that he experienced with God crushed him in his soul. Experienced three hours of darkness like had never been seen in the world in which he was separated from the unity of God the Father. See, it's a wonderful thing to study the cross. You'll find that when Jesus first begins speaking on the cross, the first thing that he says out of his mouth is, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Father. It indicates that relationship with the Father is still intact, that they're still one, they're still in unity. About middle way, while Jesus is hanging on the cross, he says something else in a different way. He doesn't address God as Father, but he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Something's changed about the, about the relationship between the Father and the Son. Something has come in that has separated that unity that they had. Jesus never did anything wrong. Jesus never sinned. That unity was not broken because of something that he had done. But I would say to you this morning that while Jesus was hanging on the cross and he looked up at God and he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I would say that the sin that caused him to be separated from his Father was the sin that had been committed by me. And the sin that had been committed by you. And Jesus was willing to be separated from the Father so that you and I might have the opportunity to inherit eternal life. He's willing to do it. But then the final thing that Jesus says when he's hanging on the cross, is he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Beginning of the cross, the unity was still there. About middle way, the whole world was covered in darkness. An earthquake came upon the city of Jerusalem, and the unity had been broken. But there at the end, the Father and the Son were reconciled together. I believe the Father thought what he may have said many days earlier at the Jordan River. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. It was a painful death. But then thirdly this morning, let me give you this and I'll be done. It, it was a powerful death. It was a powerful death. The Bible says in verse number 30, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said three words, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. See, Jesus... Death was not only prophetic, it was not only painful, but it was also powerful. And, and nowhere in Scripture is the power of his death more clearly demonstrated than in John chapter number 19 and verse 30. Jesus says, I thirst. They take a sponge, they soak it in vinegar and water, and they put it in his mouth, and, and, and he drinks it to some extent. And then after he's taken the vinegar, he utters this sixth phrase, and he says, It is finished to tell us die. The word in the Greek language is translated to bring to an end or to carry 
out. Jesus was saying to God and to those who were watching and those who would read later on down through the times of history, it has been accomplished. It has been carried out. It has been brought to an end. It was done. It was over with. People say, preacher, why do you believe that a person who is truly and genuinely saved can never be unsaved? Because I believe that Jesus told the truth when he said, it is accomplished. Therefore, when I trust in Jesus Christ, I'm not trusting in my own self to be able to save myself, but I'm trusting in the finished work of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying to all those people in his presence, it's done, it's accomplished. And now his life was coming to an end. Not the cry of a helpless martyr. Not the last gasp of a worn out old man. Not the sigh of relief for one who had completed their sufferings. But it was a declaration by a king. It was the cry of a divine redeemer claiming that all those for which he had come and all those things which he had come to do were now completed and accomplished. Everything that was needed for the putting away of sin had occurred. Everything that must take place for man to have a right relationship with God had happened. Jesus said, it is finished. Jesus was not saying that he was finished. Jesus was saying that his work was finished. Jesus was saying that his purpose for coming had now been fulfilled. If you study the Greek language, there are many words that Jesus could have used to ex ex explain this. There were many words that Jesus could have used to uh, give the idea that this was accomplished. For some reason, Jesus said this word in the Greek, tetelestai. Had many uses in the ancient world in those days. When a servant had been sent out into the field by his master to complete a task. Upon finishing the task, he would return back to the master and with joy say, to Telestai meant the work had been done. In the first century, the priests, as they would examine the animal sacrifices and they would check them to see if they were without spot or without blemish or they were acceptable and appropriate for the for the sacrifice that was about to be made, if the priest found that the animal was exactly as it should be and everything was right, he would declare, Tetelestai, it is sufficient, it is accomplished, it is worthy. A first century artist painting a masterpiece portrait might look at his work after he had spent weeks and even months and perhaps even years pouring his own self into his work. And if the picture was exactly as he wanted it, a masterpiece of all masterpieces, he might cry out at the finish of his task, Tetelestai, it is accomplished. Perhaps the most meaningful illustration for us today and one that we could really understand and wrap our minds around is the idea of the merchant. See, when a person would make a transaction in the ancient world, the merchant would receive the full sum of money that was owed. He would declare... To Telestai, payment is received. Payment is complete. The debt is erased. It is paid in full. In fact, archaeologists 
have found many tax receipts written on papyrus that date back to the ancient Greek world. And many of these tax receipts bear on them the word inscribed to Telestai. It was a word that would be written on the receipt to indicate that the payment had been taken care of. And when the tax collector would come to collect, they could show that tax collector that bill and that word, and they could say to him, See here, there is nothing that is owed. And by that one simple word, the tax collector would know that they were taken care of. In the Gospel of John, before Jesus was ever crucified, and in fact, just as he was coming on the scene, John the baptizer prophetically spoke. He said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. If I believe the whole of Scripture right, then I believe that if I commit one sin, that it puts me outside of fellowship with God. And it's, it's not even the kind of sin. It could be as simple as telling a little white lie. See, because you're not out of fellowship with God because you commit sin, you're out of fellowship with God because you're born a sinner. And when Jesus Christ said it is finished, what he was actually saying there was all the sins that put you outside of fellowship with God, all the debts that you owe that you could never pay, He was willing to pay them, even though he did not owe them. And that's why the scripture uses the word love associated with these events. But God has commended his love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What manner of the love the, the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called the children of God. What kind of person would pay a debt for an enemy? Especially a debt so great. Our God would do that. And our God would do that for you. And our God would do that for me. Jesus Christ did it for you. And Jesus Christ did it for me. Willingly paid a price that he did not owe so that you could receive a gift that you could never earn. So the Philippian jailer came to Paul and Silas and said to them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe, believe on the Lord Jesus. There's that word again. All throughout the Gospel of John, he says it. Believe on the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. Saved. So I want to ask you this one question this morning. Do you believe? Well, preacher, I, I affirm in my heart that Jesus Christ died and rose again. See, the Bible has a very interesting verse in the book of James. It says that the demons in hell even believe and they tremble. There's something different about this belief. It's not, just, it's not just mental assent. Oh, yes, my mind says that Jesus died and rose again. No, it's more than that. I believe it's believing in the heart. Believing in the mind. Believing in the soul. The mind gives us intellectual belief, assent to a certain set of ideas.
but to believe in the heart and to believe in the Spirit is to say, I not only believe with my intellect, but I believe with my will. Remember after Jesus had just been resurrected and he came down to the seashore and he had breakfast with the disciples and he said, he said Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, well, Lord, you know I do. If I was Jesus, I would have said, well, you know, come to think of it, Peter, I don't really know that I do. No. After the last couple of weeks. But Jesus didn't say that. He said, Peter, if you really love me, then I want you to say something. Peter, just tell me you love me. No, Jesus didn't say that because Jesus knew anybody can say three words. Jesus said, Peter, if you, if you really love me, then go do something. Go feed my sheep. Why? Because, because a life that is surrendered to Jesus is not indicated by what we say, but what we do. And see, a person's life lines up with the will of God, not by them saying, I love Jesus, but by them living a life that says, I love Jesus. And we've got a world full of people who are crisis Christians. 9-11, coronavirus, World War II. Oh, God, help us. That's good. There's nothing wrong with that. I believe we ought to turn to Jesus in a crisis. But I want to tell you what I've learned in 26, almost 27 years of living. Every day that I try to live without Jesus is a crisis. Every day that I try to walk in my own will and my own way, not submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, is a day full of crisis. So I'm trying to learn how to live my life in complete and total surrender to Him. And I want to tell you, it's a lot, it's a lot less about what I say. And it's a lot more about what I do. It's a lot more about what I do when nobody's looking. What is belief? Belief is to say, Jesus, it is you. You're the way, you're the truth, you're the life. I give my life to you. Trust you in total, complete, and faith and repentance. I realize I'm a sinner, and I cannot save myself. But I realize that you said you would save me if I would believe and give my life to you. Maybe you're listening today, maybe you're watching today, and you, uh, you don't know Jesus. Man, I want to invite you to come to know him today. July 14th, 1999, I met Jesus. He became my Savior and my Lord. Have I lived perfectly for him? Absolutely not. But I believe I'm a lot better off than I was the day I started. And I'm working for something. Striving every day to be more like Jesus. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't know him. I want to invite you to know him. Maybe you would just pray something like I prayed, just said just a few moments ago. Lord, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. I ask that you would save me, come into my heart, forgive me of my sins. Give my life to you. The one missing element of salvation that's not being preached in the 21st century is the fact that you must give your life to Jesus in total and complete surrender. Yes, it's good to believe. Nobody wants to go to hell. But that's not enough. It's yes, I don't want to go to hell, but I also know that my life is no longer my own. But I now live for the purposes of Jesus Christ and for the furtherance and the advancement of His kingdom. I live for you, Lord, not my own self. Brother Dave is going to come and sing us a song, and maybe you just need to... Maybe you just need to pray right where you're at. And, and, and let me tell you something... 
If you're lost and you feel the Holy Spirit drawing you, let me say several things. Number one, you don't have to be in a church to get saved. Number two, you don't have to be in the presence of a pastor to get saved. You don't have to be in the presence of anybody. The only person that needs to be present when you're saved is God Himself through the Holy Spirit drawing you. And if you feel Him drawing you today for salvation, then you can be saved right there where you're at. And I pray that if God is drawing you, that you would make that decision today. To respond in faith and repentance to His salvation call. It will be the best decision that you ever make. God will richly bless you. You won't have all the material things you want. But He'll bless you with every spiritual blessing. And you'll have so many benefits. Psalm said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of His benefits. You'll have so many benefits from living your life for Jesus that you, you won't even be able to believe it. God wants to have a relationship with you. God desires to have a relationship with His creation. Would you give your life to Him in faith and repentance and believe upon the Lord Jesus? Be saved. Maybe you're watching this morning and you, you say, Preacher, I'm saved, but I'm, I'm just walking so far away from the Lord. Maybe God uses this crisis to bring a whole bunch of people back to Him. Wouldn't that be amazing? And Maybe you're one of those people that God's speaking to. I'm not saying God sent the virus to bring people to Him, but I am saying that God uses all things for His glory. Maybe God will use this to bring a whole bunch of people back to Him. And maybe He's speaking to you right now and saying to you, Hey, you've been wandering, you've been living your own way, and it's time for you to come back home. It's time for you to start living the way that I want you to live. Maybe God's saying that to you this morning. Just right there where you're at. Repent. Lord, I, I'm sorry for living my own way. Sorry for living my own way, my own dreams, my own will, my own purposes. God, forgive me. I want to live for you. power of the cross is undeniably able to bring the hardest heart to a point of contrition. The power of the cross is so great that it's able to bring the farthest sinner home to God. He's able. Will you let him do his work in your life? Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for how you speak to us and through us and God we love you and we thank you for the cross I thank you that you did say it is finished and it is finished it's over with death is defeated the grave is no longer has any power we're victorious because Jesus died in our place thank you Lord pray for those watching today if there's somebody who's lost I pray that they'd be saved Somebody walking away from you, I pray that they'd be drawn back to you. Work in our hearts during this time. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day.